Thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation to uh, be here today. I'm just going to have my phone up here and just to keep myself on track with time uh, and glasses to be able to see some notes that I made uh, for myself. Um, you know, interestingly, when, when I was younger, I used to love um, being able to say, I've been doing this for 10 years or 15 years. And, and, and now when I hear things like, 20 years or longer now that just makes me feel old <laughs> I need to take all those times out of my out of any of my resume stuff but it's my pleasure to uh, be here today to talk to you about I guess the journey that I've been on and and in part uh, what I've learned uh, about knowledge translation and about knowledge brokering uh, over uh, the past number of years um, I guess one of the titles I could have given uh, for myself is knowledge broker and that's actually really uh, I think how I've ended up being here today is that um, I think for most of my career I've been really interested in helping who I was as a public health nurse so when I started public health nursing 30 years ago uh, right about now um, you know I went into public health nursing with a nursing degree and I had the good fortune to uh, go to McMaster University and one of the things we I learned about uh, in my program at McMaster was how to critically appraise research evidence and how to think about uh, using that in my practice. That was very much a part of my program. And in fact, one of my uh, lifelong mentors who continues to work with me and mentor me today, Dr. Donna Saliska, actually taught me that course in third year university. And we've continued to work together uh, in this work in knowledge brokering and evidence informed decision making in public health. But I, I went into practice as a public health nurse um, understanding the importance of using lots of different kinds of evidence, one piece of which, one component of which is research evidence, having some skill in terms of being able to tell the difference between um, research that's good enough to inform our practice. Um, but I struggled as a public health nurse in how to uh, make time out of my really busy day-to-day -day work to incorporate uh, looking, taking the time to look at the evidence. I also had the good fortune of working at, um, starting working at a public health unit uh, in Hamilton, just down the road from McMaster University, that was, um, had a culture of wanting us, uh, the staff, to use evidence in our practice. And even within that, it was still really challenging to find the time to say, well, should I spend some time reading uh, these articles or would I be out there working with my clients? Because that's really what seemed to be the most important thing for me to be doing. And sometimes what I would end up doing is taking that research home and, and trying to make time to do that reading at home and think about how to apply it. Um, but found that, I wasn't, that wasn't, um, I wasn't very effective at being able to do that either, carving out that time regularly at home. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of my ideas started to come from. Um, as I moved into uh, graduate school and started um, exploring what was involved in evidence-informed decision-making, which is a term that we use in Canada, um, what has driven me for the last uh, many years is how can I make life better for that person I was as a public health nurse who was really keen to use the research evidence, who wanted to not uh, just do practice because that was the way we've always done it. So to want to know that what we were offering was the most effective practice, um, but struggling to find the time to do it. My work as a researcher has been how do we figure out what I would have needed back then? How do we work collaboratively with public health to develop resources and tools that will be useful so that that would have been easier for me to do. And um, while I was really lucky, I seemed to finish my PhD just as we created an organization in Canada called the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, uh, which was created with uh, a mandate from the federal government to demonstrate how the money being invested in health research in Canada was 
actually changing health care and um, patient and population outcomes. So this uh, organization was just being created at the time that I finished my PhD and there was a whole new set of money set aside for research in what we call in Canada knowledge translation. Similar terms in the US are dissemination and implementation. Um, and then a few years into that, there was also the term knowledge brokering um, that evolved. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that research and also a little bit about the center I've had the pleasure of, of running for the last several years, which is less about doing research and more about supporting public health to use research. So really we're acting as knowledge translators and knowledge brokers to help a sector, public health in Canada, use the best available uh, evidence. So I'm going to talk for um, about 45 minutes and definitely want to leave some time for questions um, at the end. So we're going to start with talking a little bit about uh, a question Kathleen just asked, like really what is knowledge brokering? And actually there's many different things that it can be. What does the science currently say about knowledge brokering? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the term we use in Canada that is called evidence-informed uh, decision making and the model that guides the work that we do. Um, we've also been looking to uh, theories around the stages of change to help us as an organization uh, identify what we're doing and better capture for our funder, the Public Health Agency of Canada, what their return on investment is in funding us um, right now for 12 years and eight more to come starting next April. So we constantly are being asked to justify what are you doing with the money we give you and how do you, we know that it's actually making a difference in public health. And I'll, uh, at the same time, I'm trying to um, think about how this is relevant um, to the area that you work in. And I think there's a lot of similarities in terms of, uh, while I focus on trying to change uh, practitioner behaviors uh, among public health, the public health workforce, the public health workforce that I work with are trying to change health behaviors of their clients, primarily marginalized popula populations in Canada. Um, and one of the things that I learned along the way, my training as a public health nurse, actually, I didn't know it at the time, but set me up perfectly to be a knowledge broker um, because working with uh, high-risk families, um, new mothers and fathers was what I focused on uh, when I first started nursing. And what we learned when you went into people's homes is that you didn't tell anybody what they had to be doing, what they should be doing. You always worked very collaboratively with them to develop a relationship, a partnership, uh, to set mutual goals uh, that you would work on. Um, and you were imparting information and supporting and guiding and learning from them about what their needs are, so lots of assessment. And uh, I didn't realize at the time that those were the skills that I would need uh, as a knowledge broker and definitely as a researcher who does work in knowledge translation. Those are the kinds of skills that actually have really supported the type of work that I've done collaboratively with public health. And all of the research that I've done has been done collaboratively with public health telling me what they need and helping me develop the tools and resources. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then finish um, with some questions. Just a little bit about uh, who we are. So as Kathleen said, I'm one of six centers that are funded by what is called the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, and the six NCCs, our, our, our name was given to us, it probably wouldn't have been what I chose, um, but uh, what the name implies is that the six centers that are located from coast to coast and, and cover uh, quite a variety of topics, um, we work together to help build knowledge, skill, and capacity amongst the public health workforce in Canada to use the best available evidence, and that's not just research evidence, that's the whole gamut of the different kinds of evidence that inform um, public health and population health practices, policies, and programs. 
We really came out of uh, the SARS epidemic that if um, you're not aware, Toronto was really uh, an epicenter for a very lar relatively large number of deaths. And uh, of the many inquiries that came out of uh, SARS, it was identified that the public health community um, really lacked skill and capacity to be able to utilize best available evidence during that crisis. Uh, and from that, uh, the public health agency was created, as well as then work was put in place to put these centers uh, in place. You can see here um, that we are uh, coast to coast, not as we would now say coast to coast to coast up in the north, um, but we cover the determinants of health, healthy public policy, we're a bit fuzzy, like methods and tools, but that's methods and tools related to knowledge translation. We have one on infectious diseases, and then on our west coast, uh, two that are related to environmental health and Aboriginal health. Actually, my mistake in not changing this, they have recently changed their name to Indigenous health. So our specific mandate is to enhance evidence-informed public health, both at the practice level programs and policies, as well as to provide leadership and expertise to support the uptake of what works in public health. And so that's not only what interventions, policies, or programs work, uh, are effective in improving public health and population health outcomes, but also what works in knowledge translation. So we can be both a support to the public health workforce as well as the other uh, NCCs. And I will talk in a few moments about what I mean when I talk about evidence-informed public health or evidence-informed decision-making. We do this in a variety of ways. Um, so we're, we're actually a pretty small uh, centre. We might have, at any given time, 8 to 10 to 12 uh, full-time staff working with us. So we're not that big, but we have a very large geographic area that we need to cover. And certainly when, you, when we're federally funded, you need to make sure that you are helping everyone in the entire country. Which basically means that we can't physically visit everybody and see everyone. Um, we can't have that one-to-one -one type of relationship in a face-to-face -face way as perhaps we would like. So it's really forced us to think about how do we create resources and tools uh, that everyone in the country can access at any time. So much of what we've created, whether it's around capacity development or network networking and outreach, is available online. And Kathleen talked about that. If you visit us at nccmt.ca, everything my center has created is available online um, in both English and French and is freely available to anyone to access around the world. It's, we, When we first started thinking about how do we go about delivering this, what we think is a fairly huge mandate, we really um, created some specific um, uh, areas that we wanted to focus on. So we have some repositories, knowledge repositories, that house different kinds of evidence, whether it's on the effectiveness of public health interventions or the effectiveness of different types of knowledge translation interventions. Um, we are engaged in different types of capacity development, whether that's in face-to-face -face workshops or in online learning modules or in our knowledge broker mentoring program, which I'll tell you a bit more about later. Um, we've also created a variety of um, uh, videos to help break down some uh, complex statistical concepts, uh, made those available. And then also really, really importantly, is to connect public health folks from across the country. In our ability to talk to public health professionals who work in Newfoundland, almost at the same time that we're talking to those that work in British Columbia, so across uh, five time zones, I think it is about seven hours from coast to coast, we learned that public health professionals are grappling with the same issues all over the country and looking to the evidence to help support what they should be doing. And many times they uh, have the same types of questions. And in our brokering role, when we interact with someone in Newfoundland and find out that someone in British Columbia at the same time is having the same type of question, 
we're able to connect them to say, hey, did you know they have the same question? They're looking at some of this. Maybe you guys should speak together and, and maybe work on this together. So that's also a really important part of what we do is helping the sector share their knowledge with each other and developing mechanisms that would allow them to know what others are dealing with and how each other they might be able to help each other. So that gets a little bit about what our role as knowledge brokers are. And um, this really is just the definition that uh, I took from Wikipedia, but very interestingly is mimicked in much of the literature that we see. A knowledge broker can it really, we think about it as an intermediary person. Uh, it can be a person or an organization, and they aim to develop relationships and networks with, among, and between producers and users of knowledge by providing either linkages, knowledge sources, and in some cases the knowledge itself, such as how to do certain things or tools, um, to various organizations in its network. I would say that there are multiple definitions of knowledge brokering. This, this one is a catch-all that really brings all of it into place. In 2005, we had an organization in Canada, Canada called the, um, the Canadian Health Services Research Institute, and they uh, started writing about knowledge brokering. And they really envisioned knowledge brokering as an intermediary person that brought together the knowledge producers and the knowledge users, brought them together to be able to have conversations with each other so that you could each talk about what their needs were and then work together on in co-developing, let's say, research projects that could answer questions. Uh, and it's an interesting um, uh, definition of the word broker because it really had this person that was bringing two different groups together and almost in essence helping them have conversations with each other because at that time we believed that the researchers really struggled to understand what decision makers and policy makers needed and wanted and the same the policy makers would say I don't really understand when those researchers start talking I, I don't know what they're saying. So it was really helping to bring them together and have meaningful uh, dialogue. At the same time, I had already been doing some research uh, trying to support uh, the use of evidence amongst public health uh, professionals. And I thought of knowledge brokering a little bit differently. I thought about it as uh, not bringing the researchers and, and decision makers together, but actually a person that could say amongst this workforce of public health professionals where there's already an existing body of research that can be used to uh, inform some decision making around programming. How do we, uh, is there an opportunity for a broker to help the public health professionals become more aware of that evidence? And as we got into some of that work, then we also started to realize that there were some limitations in their knowledge and skill and capacity to be able to use that evidence in practice and to apply it to their local jurisdictions. So even way back in 2005, we had some fairly different um, definitions uh, about what knowledge brokering could be. And I don't think there's any one right way to do knowledge brokering. I think it, it depends on what context you're in. So my work always developed around working collaboratively as this broker to work within um, public health. And then we've done some expansion from there. So in the field of public health, knowledge brokers, uh, what we've been working on, facilitate the appropriate use of the best available research evidence in decision-making processes, enhancing both individual and organizational capacity to participate effectively in the decision-making process. So that's one way to think about that. And um, in the session that I was in with Kathleen, so I just need some notes here, um, this morning I, you know, I was thinking um, about a few of the comments that were made in that session. And I think something that's really, really important that I say all the time to public health professionals when we talk about evidence-informed decision-making, EIDM, is that it's using the best available evidence at the time, knowing that the evidence base is always changing. Um, and we can say the same thing for the knowledge brokering field or the knowledge translationing field. My center 
Kathleen Center. I mean, we're, it's a work in progress right now. There's still so much to learn as we, um, as we develop our ideas and implement ideas around knowledge brokering and evaluate them and then take that evaluation into consideration. So thinking about um, that the knowledge base is constantly changing and being really reflective about what worked, what didn't work to help inform those next steps both in knowledge brokering uh, and in knowledge translation is really important. So to setting that stage a bit about how we've envisioned knowledge brokering, then we start to think about, so what are the activities that one would do as a knowledge broker? I'll suggest just some of them here. Um, we could divide them into three. I'm only going to talk about three today. Knowledge management, linkage and exchange, and capacity development um, are the ones I'm going to focus on. When we think about knowledge management, what the literature would tell us is that as knowledge brokers, we identify and obtain relevant information. That also means that we need to understand what the needs of the knowledge users are, so assessment of what would be relevant uh, to them is really important. Facilitating development of analytic and interpretive skills. Uh, creating tailored knowledge products for different types of decision makers, and this would be even within the same organization. That could be by different disciplines or different levels of decision making. They're project coordinators. They need to support communication and knowledge sharing um, and monitor the process of implementation. Um, one, one thing that I talk a little bit about um, from the public health perspective and this may be similar um, in your field as well, is that in, in public health, people arrive in public health from many different um, backgrounds. So while we have a few undergraduate programs in Canada that are public health programs, um, mostly uh, public health professionals are nurses, uh, dietitians, health promoters, um, some epidemiologists, some um, public health inspectors. So people come to public health with many different undergraduate and graduate degrees, and most of the degrees that they come from, very few of them would ever find themselves working in public health. So when we think about trying to train the next generation of public health professionals, we can't just, I as a center can't just go and try to impact those educational programs because it's very, very vast. So we usually end up needing to do a lot of this work to facilitate evidence-informed decision-making once they're in public health to gain those uh, skills. So those are some of the, the knowledge management activities that brokers would do. They're also very heavily involved in linkage and exchange. So they identify, engage, and connect with stakeholders, facilitate collaboration. They connect stakeholders to the relevant information sources. When I first, uh, I would say, fell into this uh, field a long time ago, um, it seemed like what was a fair comment to say was that there, there wasn't evidence that answered my question about what was effective in public health. There was a real lack of rigorous uh, studies that really informed uh, what we would do in public health. That's no longer the case for the great majority of issues that we face in public health. There's now, at the other end uh, extreme, we have too much evidence and we can't keep up with it. Um, as an example, just when we think about chronic disease prevention and if we take one topic, uh, promoting physical activity across the lifespan, we now have um, well over a thousand reviews of the literature. Not all of them would be systematic reviews, but reviews that evaluate multiple studies, those thousand reviews representing 10 to 15,000 primary studies. So just keeping up in the field of physical activity, even if you focus that on children, um, as I've done in certain areas, now we have hundreds of reviews that uh, have compiled evidence on that. So um, it's, it's, 
uh, ensuring that stakeholders know that that relevant uh, information is there, and then as it becomes too much, where can they go where some of that might be synthesized? Supporting peer-to-peer -peer learning, and again, this is where I think knowledge brokering can come in, communication and information sharing, and then, of course, that de network development, maintenance, and facilitation. And then if we think about capacity development, this is where uh, we spend, my centre spends a fair amount of its time focused. We can think about how do we develop knowledge, knowledge and skill in defining problems, um, taking local data, figuring out what those issues are and then turning that into a focused, answerable question. And that actually intuitively seems like it really shouldn't be all that hard to do that. Um, but I work really closely with public health professionals and this is actually a really, really imp um, important thing to do and a harder thing to do uh, and really a good thing to do at a team level because really defining what that problem is and thinking about who is the population that we're interested in, what are the interventions we want to know about or programs, uh, what are we comparing that to and what are the outcomes that we're really interested in knowing something about and having a team figure that out. You can really um, see the differences that people have in their minds about these types of questions and really focusing on uh, coming to consensus on what that is so that whatever work that is done to compile the evidence does actually in the end answer that question. Developing capacity about appraising the quality of evidence, we certainly spend a lot of time on, on that, knowing that many don't enter the field uh, really confident in knowing how to do that. And certainly, um, while it's still apparent today, there's, there's a wide variety in the quality of evidence that is available. And that's not to say that, that, that in appraising it, it's um, to to disregard lower quality evidence, but actually to have a better appreciation of uh, the limitations of research. What impact does that have on, on how we interpret those results and if we should have any caution in implementing them. Uh, we design and deliver tailored training sessions, facilitate knowledge dissemination. It's really important to assess readiness and capacity for change, and that's at the individual level and also at the organizational level. So we do a lot of thinking about who's, who's ready for this, who's showing those signs that they want to move forward, um, understanding that, and then working, uh, uh, developing um, programs and strategies, interventions, where people are at, starting where people are at and building on their strengths um, is really, really important. I wrote in here, generate buy-in among stakeholders, and um, I really don't like the word buy-in. I've never really thought that buy-in uh, has a place in terms of evidence-informed decision-making, knowledge translation. Um, and with knowledge brokers. If we really are engaging our stakeholders very early on in the process, we don't get their buy-in. They're a part of it. They're, they're wanting to be there because there's an issue they are passionate about that, that needs to be solved. And that is, to me, a much better place to do this work from than actually figuring something out and then trying to get someone to take it up uh, later. So much to the chagrin of most, many of my colleagues at McMaster when I finished my PhD and was, um, uh, when this new research institute was started, one of the first things that they uh, changed in uh, research funding in Canada was that you had to write a little paragraph about how you were going to disseminate and promote the uptake of, of uh, your research when it was done. And so I quickly became the go-to person at McMaster that was to help everybody write that paragraph. Um, and yet I came from the camp that said, well, actually, if you've done your research really well, you would already have those stakeholders involved in the research, uh, so you wouldn't be getting their buy-in after the fact. So um, many of them had to go back and think, okay, we didn't have any of our stakeholders involved at the beginning, what are we going to do now? Um, we've learned along the way that uh, you, we can do all the training we want with individuals 
in organizations in public health, but if they don't work in an organization that values the use of evidence in practice and actually function in a way that supports the use of evidence, then um, I started to feel like we might actually be harming people because we were showing them a different way to practice, but they didn't work somewhere that actually really uh, encouraged that or facilitated that to happen. So now we really do both together. We, we get work with organizations that really are committed in, and see the importance of using evidence at the same time that we then start developing the capacity in the staff. And that, we think, will help with sustaining um, that organizational engagement. Uh, my first study in knowledge brokering actually was in the mid-2000s. Uh, and uh, one of the things that was interesting at the time when I was recruiting the knowledge broker for my randomized control trial was thinking about, well, what would be the characteristics of an effective uh, knowledge broker? And interestingly enough, while we do um, have a, a, a list here of the types of characteristics, we still have a lot to learn about um, what are those characteristics? Are you born with them or can you be trained with them? Um, and, and so some of the ones that we see here, uh, someone that has the ability uh, to, to be a networker, to facilitate networks, who's really good at problem solving, innovating, they need to be trusted and credible. Many of you will know this. They need to be clear communicators. They need to understand, in the way that we've envisioned knowledge brokering, um, they need to understand the culture of both the decision maker and the research world. And, they, and even better if they can really feel comfortable going back and forth between the two. Uh, they need skills in being able to find and assess and interpret different kinds of research evidence in different formats. They need to be able to really uh, talk about the findings of research in really accessible ways to many different kinds of audiences. So the way that I would talk about research to a medical officer of health is not the way I would speak to a director in that same organization, not the, way I, the same way I would message it to managers, and not the same way I would message it to frontline staff. So a really efficient knowledge broker will develop ease in their ability to translate evidence in different ways. They need to facilitate, mediate, negotiate, um, and really think about adult learning principles as well. Um, in, in terms of you need a very special uh, approach to being able to bring people together who have very different ideas potentially about research, about maybe a hierarchy of research. Um, we might bring people together in a room where some think randomized control trials are are it, that's the only thing they want to consider, wouldn't consider any type of qualitative research, and we need to be able to help them understand we need all the evidence we can get our hands on, and it all is important at different times in the decision-making process. Um, so we need to think carefully about how we uh, interact and develop um, collaborative partnerships as people are learning. So I've often thought about um, a term which is symbiosis. Some of these to me are very relevant to the term knowledge brokering. And really for us, uh, in the work we've done for years, it's the mutualism, where both organisms benefit. So when we think about some forms of knowledge brokering, and, and certainly in the way that we've been doing brokering for the last several years, we are working very closely with public health to help them develop some knowledge and skill and think about how, to, how do we do work in a different way. But at the same time, we've learned from the decision makers we've worked with just how the work happens and how the organization functions. Um, and they've been actually extremely generous in sharing that knowledge with us so that we can develop resources that actually are relevant, uh, feasible, applicable to the different types of settings that folks work in in public health. So I very much think of knowledge brokering as a, as a two-way street for as much as we've worked with public health to help them with with various uh, decisions and capacity development, 
they've really helped us along the way um, in terms of understanding what the practice realities are so that the, the resources we put in place will be useful to them. In the original um, knowledge brokering inter uh, uh, definition that I gave you where it was that intermediary person bringing two people together, that might be more like the second one here, which is where one benefits and maybe the other is uh, unaffected. So that could possibly be um, another way to think about uh, knowledge brokering. Um, and we'd really hope that the latter ones here are not necessarily what we're achieving, but it, to me it was always, I always felt like this idea idea of symbiosis, some parts of it were really um, key to knowledge brokering. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about knowledge brokering uh, impact. So it's not great news when we look at the literature uh, right now. Um, there, one of the, I guess there's two key things uh, that jump out of the few reviews that have been published over the last few years, um, is that there isn't a lot of research yet on knowledge brokering, and that we need uh, knowledge brokering studies to be happening uh, in many diverse settings, um, fields, and using different types of methodologies to then synthesize that. So that there is a way to bring together the knowledge brokering work and studies that I do in public health with the, with the work that Kathleen's group is doing. We need more studies to help us build our, our understanding of, of what is happening in knowledge brokering. And the reviews that are out there currently tell us more rigor is needed in those, uh, in the primary studies that are being done. So some of them, not to say uh, that I'm talking about uh, randomized controlled trials, but just in whatever the research design is that's being used, it is the most rigorous that is appropriate. And certainly any of you that may have read um, the result of my uh, knowledge, the first knowledge brokering trial I did in the early 2000s, one of the final recommendations I gave in that paper was that we not use a randomized control uh, design to evaluate knowledge brokering. It really doesn't um, fit that type of approach uh, in that I don't believe there's any way to really randomly um, allocate organizations that will then have two equal groups. And in the way we did knowledge brokering, there was no one single intervention that anyone, um, anyone received in that. What we do know a bit about um, in terms of the impact is that there does appear to be a link, and I use that, the word may, um, because of the, the limitations of the existing literature, but there does appear to be a link between uh, what knowledge brokers are doing and an increase in knowledge skills and changes in practice behaviors that align with what the best available evidence says. So there's. There's, there's great promise in knowledge brokering, but we have a lot more work to do to really understand it. So I just want to tell you a little bit more about evidence-informed decision-making, and this is the model that we use. Um, and this was a really helpful model uh, that's, that's been around um, in Canada for a number of years now. But this, this really gets at the complexity of decision-making. Um, in the early days of uh, research dissemination or knowledge transfer and exchange, so uh, early 2000s, many talked about, um, you know, th th that, that we were talking about just using research evidence and not thinking about all of the other things that go into decision making. And that really isn't what we're talking about with evidence-informed decision making. This model helps depict that we know in public health, and I would uh, think in your field as well, that decision making is really complex and it's made up of lots of different inputs, one of which is research evidence, others is community health issues, local context, community and, and uh, societal political preferences, and the kinds of resources that we have, both financial um, and, uh, and at the individual level. And that then it's our public, for us, public health expertise that helps us gather data in all of these spheres and then think about the local implications and then use that to apply it 
um, in what makes sense jurisdictionally. And what this allows us to think about, even just in my own province in Ontario, is that what we might do in Hamilton, which is in southern Ontario, using the same information in that purple bubble, using the same research information, but when we look at all of the other data collected in the other bubbles, if I'm in northern Ontario, we might actually make a different decision based on what our local needs are. And all of that would still constitute evidence-informed decision-making. It's an incorporation of the research evidence and all of this other evidence to think carefully about what makes sense for our local area and then to implement that. And I, I just have a few um, pictures here because sometimes it's really hard to think about, well, what does that really mean? And I have a few examples that, that really help talk about what is this thing we call evidence-informed decision-making. Um, these are our mountains uh, in Ontario. They're not really mountains, but they used to be mountains. And um, this actually is Killarney Provincial Park. And the reason why I put this up here is when I think about the process of evidence-informed decision-making, Many of our models that have been developed, um, particularly in the early years, were um, depicted very linear decision-making processes uh, that had a defined start and stop point. Um, and really, those of you that have been involved in decision-making um, know that decision-making isn't linear. It isn't always um, rational. It doesn't only go in one direction. And so when we think about decision-making, we need to think of something that's probably a bit more like a circular process, which brought me to a backpacking trail that is in Killarney that is a loop. And you can start it in any direction. Um, and it also depicts, um, to get to this, this vantage point here, is a huge amount of work that, you know, in getting there, you're usually asking yourself, why did I think this was a good idea? Why did I want to do this? But then you come and you have a great view and then you think this was totally worth it. And that's a little bit about what EIDM is all about, is that it is really, really hard work. There's no one right way to do it. Um, but there can be some great gains to be had in, in putting in that work um, to, to achieve it. It's not the only picture I'm going to show you about EIDM because um, in this particular instance, you can do this by yourself um, or you could do it as a group. And you're basically told, as you would in similar trails here, you know, make sure you can do it by yourself because you need to be self-sufficient. We're not just going to come in and, and help you. And that's really not what EIDM is about. And so I have this one here as well, which is about a summit. This one happens to be of Kilimanjaro. But the, the reason why I show you this is about a team effort. So to, to summit Kilimanjaro requires many different people to work together um, in order to be able to achieve that goal. And that's what we need um, to achieve evidence-informed decision-making. And then this last one here is about, um, while it might not seem like it, it might seem like um, trust. Uh, and this is all about uh, trust in that you're out for a nice little walk on a glacier and quickly told that you need to just cross this ladder over a big drop in order to continue on with the rest of your day. And you need to trust that the people that are setting that up have really done that properly. And trust is really important in evidence-informed decision-making and in our work. We need to develop trusting relationships with those um, we want to work with um, and, and, you know, sometimes it can be really difficult to um, reflect and identify, particularly if you are a manager or a director, what you don't know in order to be able to use evidence in practice. And you need to be able to trust who you're working with to use that information carefully. Um, something else that guides our work um, and is now very much in transition. So when we first started uh, with this very big open um, you know, field, what were we going to focus working on when we first started doing um, our capacity development with the National Collaborating Center? So we decided um, there was this model here that is a seven-step process that 
we could start with, and we've developed all of our resources actually really aligned to these seven steps. Defining a problem, finding the relevant evidence efficiently and effectively, being able to sift through that evidence to uh, understand its quality, knowing how to synthesize it, figuring out how to adapt it to be relevant and applicable to the local uh, setting. Now if I want to change practice, how do I go about doing that? Whether I have three staff or 500 staff or 1,000 staff, how do we go about implementing an organizational change to change practice? And then how do we evaluate? How do we know that we've changed practice and that everybody is doing the new behavior that we're hoping they're doing? And if we have changed practice, how do we know we're actually having that change um, impact on the health outcome that we were interested in? So we started with that. Sorry, i just go back there for a moment. We started with this model, and we've been focused on this um, for quite a bit of time. And now we've realized it's time to evolve in that this is only one very small part of uh, the capacity that folks need to have, and it's only one small part of decision making. We really need to think about now how this really focuses a lot more on some of the research evidence, but how do we incorporate the evidence from the other bubbles that I was just showing you, the local contacts and the um, societal preferences and the resources? How do we fit all of that together within a decision-making process that an organization may have? So we're embarking on a multi-year program, again, working really collaboratively with public health to figure out how, what changes need to be made to our models that adequately reflect the realities of the practice setting. So in terms of some of the similarities between public health and the VR setting and, and knowledge brokering, you know, that idea of changing health professional behavior, that's what we're doing. You have the various professionals that you're working with. How do we go about changing um, behavior, particularly when everybody is really, really busy. Um, how do we uh, promote that? Changing our clients' behavior with the idea that that's what's driving us for the different kinds of outcomes that we're looking for. And then the context and, and the culture. We've had a few things that have helped us out in Canada um, in terms of both at the national level and uh, in some of the provinces where the expectation to demonstrate the use of evidence in practice um, is very up front and center. It's actually been written into a number of um, uh, standards for public health practice that it's the, the onus is on public health professionals to demonstrate that they are in fact practicing in an evidence-informed way. And so that's really driving um, uh, the culture and the context of the public health setting to be changing to then be really ready for, for moving in this direction. So looking for those kinds of drivers would, are, is really um, important. So I want to talk a little bit more about where do practitioners fit in, and I use that word lightly. So um, we, could, um, we could put counselors in here, we could say the workforce, but specifically what are, what's the call to action um, for the frontline folks in terms of how, how can I as one person have an impact in my organization and evidence-informed decision-making? We can always be questioning practice. If we've been doing the same thing for several years, maybe we should be thinking, is there anything, how do I know this is still the best thing that I should be doing? Because the knowledge is constantly changing. We need to be critical consumers of everything that passes by our devices, our screens, um, because a, a, a fair amount of it perhaps isn't something that should, um, greatly influence our thinking. I need to have new knowledge. I need to be constantly developing new skills. How can I be involved in program decisions? Can I have any impact on organizational structure? And where we've been working a bit more is in influencing and motivating our peers. Um, I'm just going to go through these quickly. I'm, I think I'm quickly running out of time. So 
as uh, knowledge brokers, we usually experience lots of different types of reactions, and some of these um, I'm sure will resonate with you. Um, this one here is, you know, the, the where everyone just has their head down, hoping that if we just keep quiet long enough, this will all go away and everything will go back to normal. That's really what we have to know how how to deal um, with that. Or other times, people are really quite openly resistant and want to push us back. Um, we need to know, have strategies for how to deal with that, or people that are really, really on board and are wanting to get going really, really quickly, and that might even be a little bit uncomfortable for us. One of the things we've done um, in terms of thinking about how, how do we break down what we're doing using a, a, um, a theory of change, we have really uh, thought about our work in four ways, where we are developing um, products that may help, um, that we think will help the workforce develop new skills. That moves towards public health professionals then seeing us as the go-to place to access that information and we start to see use of those. So the, the actual accessing of the resources that will help build capacity. We then start to see um, a need to actively measure whether or not health professionals are engaging in the uh, what we call EIDM behaviors and then seeing if we see a change in practice. So that's how we've really started to think about of all the data that we collect when we try to pull it all together to tell a convincing story to our funder that we're making an impact, this is the type of approach um, that we've looked at. So I just want to finish with a couple of examples. Um, so we did a, a, what was called a Partnership for Health System Improvement study a few years ago. And this is where uh, this funding competition required me to have as a co-primary investigator with me um, decision makers. So as a researcher, I needed to have a, a, an, an equal counterpart who came from the public health community. I actually had three medical officers of health who partnered with me as primary investigators. And they also had to provide 30% of the funding to do the research in order for me to be able to apply for the program. And we wanted to know what the impact of a tailored knowledge brokering intervention would have on knowledge capacity and behavior for EIDM and also what factors would facilitate it. We used three, we worked really intensively with three public health units in Ontario, and we developed three different interventions based on the needs of that organization. So we've spent a lot of time um, really assessing what those organizations needed and wanted. And in fact, with the way funding cycles go, it was over a year from the time we did the initial development of the grant to receiving the money, to being ready to implement. Even by then, the organizations had changed what their needs were, and we needed to respond to that and change what our intervention would be, which we were able to do. Um, just in terms of, uh, sorry, with all of them, we did a lot of capacity development. Many of them were involved in doing their own rapid synthesis of the, of the evidence. We did large-scale training. We did lots of um, interaction with senior management. Uh, so it was a, a, a very mixed type of intervention. Um, and just a little bit about uh, what we found was that uh, just attending large group training sessions was not effective in changing behaviors related to EIDM, but those who worked significantly over a prolonged period of time with the knowledge broker definitely showed significant um, improvements in their evidence-informed decision-making behavior as well as in their knowledge and skill related to the tasks of evidence-informed behavior. Um, there were lots of things that were important um, uh, around supporting the contextual factors. So certainly the knowledge broker being embedded within the organization was important and having knowledge and skill and rapport with the workforce. In all of the organizations, evidence-informed decision-making was a priority and where there was the most senior leadership uh, support and modeling of the behavior, we tended to see um, the biggest gains. As always, things that 
can get in the way, time, competing priorities, um, lots of um, uh, anxiety and uncertainty about what was the expectations for staff to engage in this. So whenever we could get senior management to be clarifying clearly what the expectations were, this was definitely helpful. The library services um, could sometimes work in a way that was uh, opposite to what we were trying to promote, so that was really important to uh, address. And then, of course, everyone has different definitions of what evidence-informed decision-making is, so coming to some consensus on what that was. So this actually helped us think about um, we needed to be working with organizations at the same time that we were develop, developing capacity in individuals. Um, that we needed this to be a team effort, that you don't just train one or two people, it needed to be many people, um, and that you needed to be thinking about where did this fit in the, um, in the broader mandate of that organization. Um, I'm going to skip over this. This is, again, um, what we're currently doing is a knowledge broker mentoring program. We've taken the results of that uh, study and really used that to inform a program that we now uh, deliver across the country. Um, if I just go back so far, we've had uh, 10 organizations across two cohorts participate the, um, in this program, and we work intensively with organizations over about two years of time to develop, again, individual capacity as well as organizational mechanisms and processes. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about what we've seen as some findings from that is, again, our assessments are showing that we are seeing improvements in knowledge and skill in the tasks associated um, with knowledge uh, translation. And you'll have these uh, slides. This is really just for some um, reading afterwards. In the qualitative an uh, analysis that we've done, people really talk about how this has helped them really think about doing their work in a very different way um, and how useful they found it in terms of their uh, thinking. Um, when we divide it into some of the key tasks, it's helped them think about finding evidence in a different way. They feel more confident. They feel more confident in their ability to appraise evidence. They have a better understanding and, and confidence in using different kinds of evidence and even in producing evidence themselves and in tailoring that into the populations that they speak with. So in closing, knowledge brokering seems to hold promise in a variety of settings. We still have much to learn about the role and about the personality characteristics and about how to train knowledge brokers to be knowledge brokers. Uh, as well as on capacity development. And I'll stop there. Thank you.